Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to another one of our Tring Book Festival uh, events. The uh, the panelists have been a bit preemptive here. Well done. Um, can you welcome to the stage our uh, panelists today, hosted by Alice Adams, got Mary Jordan, Dr. Jerry Thompson, and Tune Tobes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. I hope you've had time for lunch. I'm Alice. I'm the host for, uh, for this afternoon's talk, and we've got a fantastic, um, fantastic panel here. Um, just to kick off with a couple of, a couple of stats, um, there's 850,000 people in the UK with dementia, and one in three people um, will care for someone with dementia in their lifetime. I'm one of those people. My mother-in-law has Alzheimer's disease, and that's one of the reasons I was really interested to chat to the panel um, today and to get involved in this event, which feels really worthwhile. So I'll just briefly introduce the, the panel, and then we'll, then we'll kick off. So please welcome Jerry Thompson. He's been working as a doctor for the last uh, 40 years, mostly as a GP. And over the last 20 years, he's been particularly interested in individuals who've made uh, recoveries from what seems like incurable illnesses through methods that aren't really recognized or they're poorly understood by the medical profession. And he's also authored um, a chapter in Mary's book, which I'll go into in a minute, to do with dementia and drugs. And also Mary Jordan, who, um, has years of experience providing training for carers and also care professionals working with people with dementia and in care homes and also providing support for people whose lives are affected by dementia. She's written numerous papers and articles and books on the subject, um, including guides for um, carers. And she's authored the book The D Word, which is available today. Her new book, which is called Dodging Dementia, is out in January, and that focuses on exploring the possible causes of dementia and how lifestyle choices reduce um, individual risk of developing it. And Jerry, I'm so sorry, I forgot to mention your book. Uh, <laughs> is that why we're here? Um, That's okay. So Jerry's new book is called Curing the Incurable Beyond the Limits of Medicine, and um, like I say, that focuses on ways in which people have recovered from illnesses that aren't always recognized by, um, by tradition, not traditional. Con um, uh, not able to be cured by uh, standard methods, say, terminal cancer, for instance. Please. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Joe. Thank you. Um, and finally, last but not least, Tim Tobis, who's joined us from the Netherlands today. He's a healthcare student fighting for better care for people with dementia. And he's lived in a nursing home for the last three years. He just moved out last month. Um, but living there as a resident alongside people living with dementia rather than living there as a care professional. And he co-authored an international bestseller called The Housemates with Jonathan de Jong. And um, which is all about his experiences there and what he learned about how we can improve and change the care system to improve uh, quality of life for people with dementia. Also, um, he and Jonathan have a new film that's coming out, hopefully in the UK next year, which is called Human Forever, which we can just see a little bit of just now, I think, a little trailer for. <laughs> Mijn naam is Steun. Ik ben 24, kerngezond en woon op de gesloten afdeling van een verpleeghuis. Waarom? Ik ben 24, maar niet heel mijn leven. Daarom ga ik nu op zoek naar antwoorden voor later. In een reis van drie jaar door elf landen en vier continenten... kijk ik hoe wij in de wereld omgaan met dementie... en de mensen die hiermee moeten leven. 
En hoe kunnen wij de samenleving in de toekomst inrichten... voor de mensen die onze aandacht zo hard nodig hebben... maar die wij zo vaak vergeten? Iedereen, ondanks leeftijd of diagnose... heeft toch hetzelfde recht op een goed leven? Ja, ik ben toch helemaal niet meer van, van enig nut... Heeft u dat gevoel? Ja. En het is toch ook zo? Wat voor, wat voor nut heeft ze nou nog als ik leef? format for this afternoon's event. Um, the panel and I will talk through a few things for about 40 minutes and then we'll be opening up the floor to any questions that you might have. Um, I should say in doing the reading for this that I mean the wealth of experience and knowledge that's here is amazing and the, the topic is so broad that there's no way we can discover it in an hour. We've already been chatting for an hour and we're nowhere near. Um, <laughs> So there will be an opportunity to ask questions um, at the end, and I'm sure that you'll want to dive more deeply into some of the things we touch on. What I would say is that the panel, understandably, aren't able to offer a personal advice service, but they're really happy to answer broad questions or talk about the, the topic more broadly. And I think, Ben, will there be some online questions as well, potentially? Yeah, yeah, just, sorry, just sending a note to the online audience to say you can put questions through the Q&A function. Great, thank you. Um, so I guess, firstly, start at the beginning, um, and Jerry, if I can direct this one at you, is what, what is dementia? What are the main forms and how many people does it affect? Uh, well, there's different types of dementia, and I think, uh, as you've mentioned, uh, it's, it's becoming a very common disease, about 800,000 people in, in the country um, have it. The commonest form is Alzheimer's disease, which probably accounts for 70 to 80 percent of dementia there is another form lewy body dementia is thought to account for about one in five um but uh there's vascular dementia and there's probably other more minor ones but certainly alzheimer's is the main disease we see thank you um one of the things i was um struck by which i guess kind of seems obvious now but it was something that i read in mary's book was that although our brains change with age dementia isn't necessarily a natural part of aging it's associated with it but it's not a natural part of it and your stats about the fact that one in 14 people over the age of seven at 65 have dementia and then it's one in six when you get to over 80 but that means that five in six people over 80 don't have dementia so what do we know about what increases the risk? And I don't know if yourself or Jerry would like to say a bit on that. Okay, so uh, that's probably the biggest question of all, what increases the risk of dementia? Because I'm sure what everyone would like to know here is how do we actually reduce our risk of um, uh, dementia? And I think you could say, no one thing is going to completely protect you from dementia. But if you do enough of the things which are helpful and remove enough of the things which are likely to trigger it, you will eventually um, get to a, a, a situation where you tip the balance and it makes dementia a, a lot less likely. Um, would you like me to just go through all the factors? It'd be interesting to know, yeah, some of the things that we know increase the risk, because we were talking about causes, um, but we, we don't really know exactly what causes it, but we do know what factors might increase the risk. So I don't know if yourself or Mary would like to say a bit on that. Uh, yeah, okay. Let, let me just go uh, through that. And obviously, I won't be able to cover it all in detail. Um, if you do want more information, I do have a website. It's on under Dr. Jerry Thompson. You can Google that. And if you look up dementia, new ideas, it will cover this in more detail. But as I say, um, it's reducing um, the risk factors and increasing the uh, positive factors. So let's take food for, uh, to begin with, as that's probably one of the most important factors. 
Um, let's take the negative initially. The biggest dementogen, the biggest single factor which is going to push you towards dementia is sugar. Um, uh, sugar has been correlated with poor memory. So we, we know this and we know it in a lot of different ways. So a lot of the substances which break down to form sugar, the refined carbohydrates, will also push you that way. And we know why this happens. It produces more insulin in the body. Um, and probably about one in three of the audience here today will have what we call metabolic syndrome, which is associated with high insulin, usually from having too many of those sort of foods. Uh, um, as I say, that will increase the risk. However, it's quite easy to identify on the blood test that you've got metabolic syndrome. And uh, once you know you've got it, you can uh, do something about it. Put the sweeties away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other one is ultra processed food. Now, we know in this country that 55 percent of our calories come from ultra processed food, which is higher than most other countries. You only need 20 percent, that's 400 calories, um, to come from ultra processed food to push you into cognitive decline. That could just be a breakfast which contains cereal or several slices of bread or toast. So beware of ultra processed food as well. So if we had to say the two biggest factors here, it's going to be sugar refined, uh, combined with uh, com, um, refined carbohydrates and insulin and ultra processed foods. However, the good news is there are foods which will push you in the right direction. Uh, we know that fish is protective. Um, but I, we have to specify a little bit which ones. It's particularly the, the MASH group, which is uh, mackerels, anchovies, um, sardines, and um, herrings. Uh, whereas for big fish, like your tuna, which contain mercury, which will probably push you in the wrong direction. So fish is going to be beneficial for sure. Um, uh, fruit and vegetables, we know are helpful. Uh, People who take more antioxidants have 70% reduced risk of dementia. And there may be some superfoods as well. Turmeric uh, has been particularly noted in India uh, and places which eat a lot of that, there's lower rates of dementia. So that sort of covers the basics of food. Thank you. How? Sorry, I was just going to say anything that um not food related that mary wanted to to add or you wanted to expand on not food related <laughs> i think the most important thing is socialization people need other people wow. so and being isolated is a risk factor yes and the huge number of clients who come to me and just say oh well we're not social people i don't mean that you need to be a party animal but we did notice during COVID a uh, big re um, increase in dementia. And that's, I think, due to the social isolation. I think people need, to t need other people. Yeah. And it's very important. That's a very important factor. So keep socializing, keep meeting people, keep talking to people. Don't hide yourself away. Absolutely. Sorry, Joe, did you want to add anything? Else? Yeah, I'll just uh, go on to the other uh, risk factors here. Um, there is a chapter in there is, uh, but which, it, which I've added on drugs and dementia, and there are certain drugs which will definitely push you in the wrong direction. And two of the most commonly prescribed drugs are PPIs like omeprazole and lanzoprazole. Those block B12 um, uh, absorption, which is very important. Uh, for your mind, and also it blocks an enzyme which stops the breakdown of amyloid. So you want to be very careful about drugs like that. I would also say statins, which reduce uh, cholesterol. Low cholesterol is associated uh, with dementia. So be, and there are other drugs as well. So that is one thing I would look at, but you're not on any drugs which are pushing you in the wrong direction. Uh, Artificial sweeteners uh, are another one that one study showed a 
300% increase in dementia and stroke on people regularly eating artificial sweeteners. Uh, we know aspartame breaks down to formaldehyde. That's well known scientifically. We also know formaldehyde has effects on memory, on behavior and on learning. So these are some things you just don't want to have. Um, chemicals, we've got a whole range of those. Most pesticides break down uh, or stop uh, the cholinesterase enzyme. So that it's targeted at the nervous system of insects. Unfortunately, it has an effect on uh, ourselves as well. So beware of uh, pesticides, eat organic if you can. Um, most chemicals are lipophilic. What does lipophilic mean? I'm glad you're explaining. <laughs> it, it, it means it, it goes to the fatty parts of the body. Where is that? Well, apart from your midline, it's also your brain and your nervous system. So most chemicals, um, that might be something you eat, but it might be things you absorb via the skin, uh, are likely to end up in your brain. Heavy metals are another body, um, particularly uh, mercury, which you get from amalgam fillings, uh, certain fish, um, um, aluminium, aluminium cooking ware, uh, coffee pots, uh, deodorants, um, and also uh, fluoride, which is completely unnecessary uh, for the body. Um, that's a, a, another one to avoid. Um, finally, while we talk about uh, toxicity, I think we need to uh, mention electromagnetic fields. We're all exposed to far more of those today than we ever were. Now, there's some experiments done in Sweden uh, by a, ga a guy called Leif Salford. And what he did is he exposed adolescent rats to a field equivalent to a mobile phone call of one to two hours. Um, a lot of adolescents, I think you would find, will be on the phone that long. It caused permanent damage to 2% of all brain cells. Um, a Turkish uh, group looked at uh, giving uh, growing mice, which were like equivalent to our children, the equivalent of a mobile phone call of one hour once a week. And after a month or two, 10% of the neurons were damaged. Um, if you do the same thing to pregnant mice, uh, their offsprings will have neurological damage. So there's a real problem with electromagnetic fields, which we're all exposed to. The top and bottom of that, if you're on a mobile phone, the shorter you can make the call, the better. Ideally, put your mobile phone on speaker mode in front of you, so you're not getting a direct hit with it. And remember, it's not just mobiles, it's Wi-Fi coming from your router, and uh, the higher source of all of electromagnetic fields are smart meters, uh, which uh, give off a massive field 24 hours a day. Jay, so, I'm going to have to go back and like reevaluate my entire house. I don't know about the rest of you. Got a positive side. <laughs> okay, I'm, is there a positive side? You can <laughs> These are things you can do to yeah. reduce your risk. And maybe I can say, after giving you the bad news, Maybe I can say some of the things you can do. Well, maybe could we move on to that? Yeah, I've got yeah. that a little bit later on. Um, but uh, I wanted to come back to um, like people who are affected by dementia or think they might be affected by dementia and just briefly touch on um, diagnosis because certainly in the early stages of dementia, it's, it's hard to know, is it dementia, is it not dementia? It can be quite concerning. And one of the things that we were discussing earlier, um, and this might be of particular interest for Tim, is that um, there are benefits around getting a diagnosis, but there's also some, some big issues and, and challenges that a diagnosis brings. Yes, of course. Um, dear people, thank you for being here. Um, and I'm still thinking about your own, your first question, like what is dementia? It depends on to who you ask the question. 
Um, and a diagnosis can help you uh, to recognize what's happening, but it shouldn't be an excuse to exclude people from society. And what we do in our Western world is that we made dementia a social death. So because you have dementia, you get a label. And because of that label, we exclude you for the last months of your life to a nursing home out of society. Um, so I think having a diagnosis, and there is a big paradox between it because it, it can help, but it, it's not okay to, to make it a reason to exclude people. Yeah, well, I, because of their disease. Yeah, really good, really good points. Um, and then thinking about um, care for people with dementia, because obviously the, the person that is living with dementia is affected, but also the, the family, the friends, the people around them are, are affected. Um, so, and I guess initially people may still be at home, they'll be, they'll be cared for at home. And I guess there's, again, there's kind of challenges and benefits for um, the person living with dementia, but also the, the carer at home, would you say? Um, are there particular benefits or, or challenges for people caring, with, caring for people with dementia at home? Uh, about the fact that they live at home or yeah. because of the diagnosis? Um, about the fact they live at home as um, opposed to a Well, home. people are still, can be st still part of society, but at this moment, our system is not uh, focused on the quality of life of someone with dementia. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the biggest problems in our society is that we um, think we can buy a quality of care, but it's always about relations. And um, um, we made quality of care the highest aim. Uh, and I think that's a big problem because the highest aim, especially in the last phase of your life, should be quality of life and mm -hmm. quality of care. Uh, could support your quality of life, but it should never be the aim. Um, and to give you one example, my own grandmother has dementia. Um, and what I see is that it's okay for her to, to, to stay at home. But what makes it a problem is that we are afraid for risks. So we are afraid that my, my grandmother could fall off the stairs. And I think that's really uh, signing for our society because we mainly focus on on safety and control and we have to accept in our society especially in our western society that life comes with risks mm -hmm. so also if you are living with dementia life comes with risks and if we accept more risks then it's easier to live at home not only for the person with dementia but also for the carer Really interesting. Mary, I don't know if you want to come in on that at all in, in terms of um, the way that support systems or societies set up. Do, do you think um, that people who are caring for someone with dementia in their own home are getting enough support or, or, or do you think there's a tendency for people to have to move into care homes because they can't be cared for at home? I think that's probably true. That. Um, I don't think people do get enough support to care for people at home, certainly in this country. Um, and I think most people do not want to have their loved one in a care home, but some, sometimes it's just too much and, that, and that's what happens because it's, they're just not getting enough support in the home to carry on. There's a tremendous strain on carers. Um, Everybody's different with dementia, uh, but one carer described it to me as like having a toddler all the time because they're following them around and they can't get them. And if in an instant like that, I think it's very difficult to, to not think about using a care home. Yeah. But I think most people would prefer not to use it. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. And so I, I think more support, more outside support, more government support, and more, more support from society, more, more understanding from society in general would help. Yeah, and I know that you've done uh, and do a lot of work supporting not just care professionals, but, but carers and, yes. and individuals. I mean, what do you find are the most common things that, that people who are caring at home struggle with? I mean, as you say, everyone's different. Um, I think it's... Uh, having some respite, because 
the, the, caring is 24 seven. You said that yourself. Um, some people with dementia don't sleep at night. Yeah, for example, so you don't get a night's rest. So I think just having some form of respite so that you get a little rest and then you can tackle, you can come back to um, handling everyday matters. So I think I would say that's one of the biggest factors. And if we had a, a, a better way of providing that sort of thing to people, I think it would help. Yeah, thank you. And um, Tim, just thinking about the fact that you, you lived in a care home alongside people living with various forms of, of dementia for three years, I mean, that must have been an incredibly like, interesting but potentially difficult experience as, as well. Um, and I know that from that experience, it's formed um, in your, it's formed really strong ideas about what, what might change, what could change, and you know, what can we do differently to, to bring you know, joy and fun and a better quality of life for people in care homes and with dementia? Well, I lived for over three years on the close ward of the nursing home. Like the, the code of the door was 2684. And I had the privilege to have the code, but my housemates didn't have the code which is really painful and it really tells a lot about the way we look at dementia. Yeah. And even though I really love my housemates, they almost all passed away already, but the pain of the system is huge because it's a system of exclusion. And you said uh, one in three is caring, will care for someone with dementia. Yeah. I think it should be more. I think it should be one on one because our personal network the chance that we get diagnosed with dementia ourselves is one in five and our personal network is bigger than only five people so if you think about it like that everyone should know someone with dementia and the fact that a family member um, that it's heavy to care for someone with dementia at home it tells a lot about the way the network of someone um, uh, is, 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 is not that big anymore so when when my housemates came in a nursing home and in the Netherlands, people live for, in general, eight months in a nursing home and then they die um, because we stay a very long time at home. Um, but when they come in a nursing home, they only have one or two family carers uh, who did a lot. But the rest of the people um, already said bye to them. So we traveled uh, around the world for the documentary you saw and we spoke with uh, Rob. He is um, um, 56 and Rob was one of the best cardiologists in the world and he traveled all around the world to speak about his profession. But when he got di the diagnosis of early onset dementia, um, no one of his colleagues ever asked, how are you doing? Because people have a fear of dementia. And um, what I constantly think, because dementia can be very painful, and there can be loss, but it's not only loss. So we should have a more honest picture about dementia. And a lot of pain people with dementia experience, like um, the feeling of being excluded, not being seen as a full member of society. That's a pain not only because of the dementia, but because of the way we treat people with dementia. And that's really something that we could change by ourselves, by changing our narrative. And I strongly believe to finish that if we see things differently, we will do things differently because this system, we constantly think, speak about this system, is not created by the Big Bang. It's the result of our own view on people. And if we keep seeing people as their disease, people with dementia won't be seen as human beings, but they keep being seen as patients. And I think that's the biggest problem in our society. Uh absolutely in tune with what you're saying. One of the things I think that most people with dementia say to me is they feel they've lost control of their lives. And, and what you're saying about excluding is exactly that we take over their lives. They no longer have, they no, they don't, no longer know whether they can go outside by themselves. Yeah. That was one of the things in your book. And I think that's really true. People with dementia feel they've lost control and I don't think that should happen. They're still able to make a lot of decisions for themselves. 
Yeah, and um, I guess one of the things we're talking about is the balance of, of um, risk, uh, you know, keeping keeping people safe, but giving them a good quality of life. And um, I know, turn one thing that struck me about your book was you said that um, there's a system where the emphasis is on um, safety and control rather than happiness and community. And I guess one of the things that I think probably we all learned from COVID is there is definitely a balance to be had um, be between safety and between ha having a life and being able to enjoy things and and, and taking and taking risks. Um, and I know that you know you were, you were saying that in the care home you lived in, somebody wanted a soft boiled egg, and they weren't even allowed well, a soft boiled egg. Yeah, so, so our human view, it's the most fundamental and everything what we speak about now, like the soft boiled egg, that's the result of our human view. And we don't see people with dementia as equal human beings. We see them as patients, which who we should protect. And we have many good intentions. I'm a nurse myself. We have, I think, too, too many good intentions because good intentions um, don't automatically lead to quality of life. And as a resident from an institute, because in fact this message, my message is not about dementia as disease, it's about the role of institutionalization in our society. It's about creating systems for people without asking, listening to people what they want. And we try to solve everything people tell by giving more care. As a nursing home resident, I wasn't allowed to go outside when it was above 30 degrees because we had a heat protocol. And in the heat protocol was described, um, because it's above 30 degrees, people um, uh, should stay inside. So the door was closed, uh, water was given to us, uh, water ice was given to us, but we weren't allowed to go outside in the last phase of our lives. And that's again a pain of the system. So to give you one example, what I really learned by living together with people with dementia, and that's also what people will read, it's, it's the, the fact that we could still build relationships. And many times people with dementia are already given up when they got a diagnosis. Um, I became one of the best friends of my housemate, Ellie. She was 92 years old. And we were almost always together. And when she wasn't able to walk anymore, she was laying in bed. But the carers and me, we, we drove her bed in my room. And she was just next to me. We weren't constantly talking. We were feeling that we were together. But when I went to university, for instance, because, because I have the code, had the code 2684, and I came back, the carer said, well, maybe you should be less close with Ellie because she is feeling sad when you are not here. She was crying when I was not there. And I think, how beautiful is it that when you are 92 years old, that you are allowed to be sad when someone is not there, that you are allowed to experience emotions, which we all have every moment in our life. So the human view on people with dementia shouldn't be that people have to be animated constantly, that people should be happy constantly, because that's not life. We should be more realistic about it. Yeah, and, yeah I think these are really interesting, really valid points, and certainly something that I observe myself from going to the care home where, where my mother-in-law is. I experience a lot of the, so, lot so of the same thing. To, to say one more thing, because it's, it's about the way we, in our Western world, we have a lot of money. The poorness of our welfare is that we constantly think in products without asking people, do you want those products? So now I can drink water, um, but when I choke in the nursing home, um, the dietist will give me a thickener. Um, when I have the risk to fall, I will get from the physiotherapist and the um, ergotherapist um, a wheelchair, maybe. Uh, when um, I don't eat for one or two days, there is a big chance that the dietist will give me uh, protein drinks to keep my body active. So we constantly, and that's also the way I was educated as a nurse, we constantly think in products. What should we do to help people? But the biggest problem is that we don't ask people what do you want? What's your need? 
And I think there's um, quite a lot of parallels between that, that kind of medicalization, um, and um, in terms of the medical approach to, to treatment. And if I can come back to Jerry, one of the things we were talking about was the fact that, you know, do we have any effective drugs? Is a limited amount of drugs for it? And whether there's some other approaches we can take to, to treatment that can slow or, or reverse symptoms that, you know, maybe wouldn't be part of a, a standard medical approach? Uh, it's a very good question. I mean, what drugs are available for uh, dementia? And many of you will have read pieces in the paper recently about these MAB drugs coming out. There's been four of them recently. Um, so that's things like denanomab that people yeah, might Yeah, e exactly. Um, basically, what they, what they found is if you do a mental function test, they cause minor benefits on that, but they have to be given by infusion. Uh, there's a high rate of hemorrhages and edema in the brain. It's not easy to do infusions in a patient with dementia, and they have to have regular MRI scans to track this. So I think you could say at the moment, we don't know if the benefits are outweighed by a downside current drugs, of which there are four, um, sometimes improve symptoms marginally, but they don't affect the long-term outcome of dementia. So what are the other, are there other approaches um, or processes or protocols that, that people try to use that might slow or reverse symptoms that are not medical? Um, Right. In a sense, I might have to follow on from what I was doing before mm -hmm. of the positive things that you can do. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of work done by uh, Professor David uh, Smith in Oxford, and he used uh, free B vitamins, B6, B12, and folate, and he tracked people with dementia, and he found that caused something like a 33% reduction in the loss of brain volume. And a number of other studies have backed him up. Um, so uh, B vitamin is very important here, but there do, do seem to be a subset of those that you only get a benefit if you've got enough essential fats particularly omega-3 fats on board. So if there's something you want to do yourself, uh, B vitamins are a particularly important one. So are the essential fats, uh, particularly omega-3, and particularly among the omega-3, something called DHA. And you need quite a lot of it, about a gram a day to make a difference. But those both work synergistically. They work a lot better than any drugs on the market. Um, so that is a way forward. Um, there are a number of other substances besides that. B3 is a very interesting one. one there was a study on, on rats, for instance, where it completely eliminated uh, uh, Alzheimer's equivalent in rats. And uh, humans who had the highest levels of B3, it was quite a high level, one to two grams of equivalent to one to two grams of niacin, um, they had 70% reduction in uh, dementia. So here you can see uh, there's a way forward. And there are a number of other substances. I haven't got really enough time to go into all of them. Uh, but we can check in the book, can't we? But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but it, there's a lot of substances, it's a bit like cancer really. There's umpteen substances which you've shown to be beneficial. No one substance is going to do it. But if you add in enough of the good things and take away enough of the bad things, you're going to make a real um, difference here. And are there other, th I mean, obviously these are substances, these are things that we can, we can take, we can change what we eat. Are there other things in terms of um, lifestyle that could make a difference? And I don't know if yourself or Mary want to talk a bit on, on that, because I know Mary, you were talking about socialization. Are there things we can do, um, I guess not, not just in later years, but I know in one of your books, I can't remember which now, they were talking about things that you do in your 40s, that's me, um, can affect your chances later. So what, what other lifestyle changes can we be making now that might you know, reduce our risk? I think um, 
One of the areas that's very important is something called brain plasticity, which is um, the ability of your brain to actually adjust to all sorts of different um, things in life. And um, we know that people with at least 12 years of education, this is not to do with intelligence, 12 years of education are less likely to get dementia. And we think that's because that has allowed their brains to become more plastic, which is a funny term, but it means more able to find different routes. Yeah, would you agree with that term? To find it's different, a funny term. yes, it is a funny term. And I sometimes um, describe this to people. It's like if you go out, you're going to go to the local shops and you find there's roadworks and you have to divert down a side street. So you go down the side street and there's an accident. So you've got to divert again and you go down that road and then the road's closed. And you know, you're, you're constantly finding different ways. You're, that is how the brain works. If it can't go one way, it'll find another way. And I try to describe the way the brain works to people as something like that. It's yeah. like having resilience. You, can, you can't do something, you find another way to, to do it. Absolutely. And your brain just does that if it's used to having to do that. Absolutely. Got you. And one of the, one of the um, in, another interesting aspect of that is sat navs mm -hmm. which are absolutely wonderful i use one they're great things but they stop people working out how to find the route to places yeah. <laughs> i've yeah. got a friend who visits me frequently and she rings me up every time and says what's your postcode again <laughs> <laughs> i said you've been here hundreds of times <laughs> and that is stopping your brain from working so we need to we need to keep our brain working. So I'm just conscious of t sorry, Joe. Sorry, just I could, quickly. Could just I just add, add exercise because this has been found in numerous studies. Various types of exercise, like like, like walking, like weight training, like like, like um, flexibility exercises to increase brain function, something like 63% or something. Uh, and this is synergistic with the other things. So an exercise program is definitely going to help uh, prevention. And in that respect, it's, there's some interesting evidence that shows that the more different exercises you do, the better it is for you. Plasticity, yeah, plasticity, plasticity again, yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it's been so, I could continue talking to you for a long time. <laughs> um, it's so interesting and there's so much more that, that we haven't been able to cover, but I'm conscious that I've been able to ask you all the things I'm interested in, but I'm sure that the audience here and the audience online have questions as well. Um, uh, so, Ben, are we okay to open I'll, up for I'll, some questions? I'll kick things off. I've got one question here. Can I urge you, if you're going to ask a question, make sure you wait for the microphone to get to you. Uh, and Jerry, if you could lift your microphone up as well when you're talking, that's great. Not right now, but when, when you're answering. <laughs> um, anyway, I've had a the, the, the hot, hot, hot off the mark first question. How do you know if you have or are getting dementia ahead of a formal diagnosis? That's, uh, that's obviously a, a very deep question. Oh, is that answerable? Uh, that is a good question. It's a difficult question because there is this uh, um, condition MCI, which is sort of... Uh, before you, possibly before you get dementia. But I, I don't think there is a, a, a way you can be absolutely 100% uh, certain. Yeah. Any questions? question just here. Hello. Um, I, just, I just wondered, um, from what we've heard, it seems like because to a degree the drugs are not massively impactful um, in terms of quality of life of someone that may or you know has been diagnosed kind of I know it sounds ridiculous but like what's the point of a diagnosis then to a degree because um, to me it feels from the things that Tun said as well it's you know it's like quite a negative thing so is it better um, as a family with someone you know with something like that to just sort of help them in ways that you can and don't worry about the diagnosis like what is it achieving for the person in the end i think in this country one of the things the benefits and there are small benefits is that you get some monetary help 
there is financial help, a small amount of financial help available to people with a diagnosis. So there's definitely a benefit to it. Jen, I know you might feel differently. <laughs> well, um, I got goosebumps when you said it because I, I, I felt the emotion. And um, I recognize it is about um, showing love to, to people. Um, the benefit in our society um, of the diagnosis is because we created a system that we finance the disease. So in the Netherlands, for instance, but it's not, um, it's not beneficial for people with dementia themselves always. Uh, it's beneficial for the system around the people. But to illustrate, in the Netherlands, um, care organizations receive money for people with dementia because they have a certain care indication. That's around 100,000 euros a year. If people become more sick and they have a diagnosis, then the care organization receives more money. So there's a perverse negative uh, stimulus in this system that looking um, at someone by their disease leads to more money. And that's a very negative thing about um, labeling people because, and that's what, what many people say when they come in a nursing home, I'm sitting here with people I don't know, and I'm living together with all people with dementia. So you are excluded and you are part of a group of only people with dementia. Um, so I think it could help a diagnosis, but not in the way we have organized this system now. Um, could I also add that just knowing the, the diagnosis of dementia and whether it's mild, moderate or severe could make a difference. There is a program developed by Dr. Dale Bredesen uh, in, in the States um, and he's getting results in mild dementia of about 90% recovery in moderate dementia of 50% recovery, but not in the end stages. Now, it is a complex program. It has been criticized for um, the, the science behind it, but this is a disease which is 100% fatal. In other words, it, it gets worse and it kills you. Now, if you only get one person who recovers on that, that shows you something important is going on um, and you don't need a double blind, blind trial. And, and he has many, many cases. In fact, he gives in his books cases of people who survived uh, and done well with, with mild dementia. So this is something to look at. Uh, particularly in the mild stages. So there are things you can do. It's just not being done um, in the in conventional hospitals, mainstream medicine, if you like. Uh, may I add one more thing? Um, because, um, in fact, the, the, the fact that people experience uh, exclusion um, is because we are a very individualistic world. So we don't live together anymore, especially not when you live with dementia. We were for the documentary in South Africa, and there they don't have diagnosis. They don't know anything about dementia. So people are not excluded because of their disease. They are still part of community. They are scared for them. But there is a very big paradox in this, because um, people don't know what dementia is. They think it's witchcraft. So it's very important to have awareness around dementia. but the fact that we know things about the disease shouldn't lead to exclusion and that's what's happening now thank you um, i really don't know where to start but i think one of the things i wanted to say in response to what, what you're saying is i've been reading wendy mitchell's book this morning and she's a woman who's um she says this is her last book she started writing when she was diagnosed with early onset dementia and she's getting she's well as she said this is her last book of three and what uh, what she did after only a couple of years she was in her 50s that's um is she stopped going for her reviews and assessments because she felt that they, it was just too depressing and because there was absolutely no benefit in it she she just turned her back on it she said i've got a life to live i know i've got a, a, a progressive disease 
and I'll just get on with it. I don't need this sort of every six months or whatever it was reminder about things are getting worse every time. So, so that's one thing, but then I can also recognize the benefits of actually having a label because that's something that, that it does help people, even simply knowing that it has a name, that, um, that all of the symptoms you might be experiencing are to do with one thing. And the other thing that was really upsetting me, I guess, is that this emphasis on things about prevention or reducing your risk and, and which the other side of that coin is that you're to blame if you had to ate too many sweets or if you didn't go and do sports or if this, that and the other, you know, that your lifestyle is to blame. But actually, you know, mortality isn't curable. It affects all of us. We are all equally mortal. If it's not going to be dementia, it'll be something else, you know, and it might be at 52, 92, 102. It's going to happen. And what really matters is to look at what, how to make life as rewarding as possible while we've got it. Yeah, I, I think just to mention briefly on that, one of the things that the panel and I were discussing, and certainly comes out a lot in Jerry's book, is that a lot of the lifestyle changes that we can make that may help um, prevent uh, the development, the chances of getting dementia, um, can help for, for lots of things and quality of life in, um, in general, it's not just specific to dementia. I have quite a specific question, probably for two. I'm looking after my husband who's 90 who has dementia and is doing extremely well. And we're doing the sorts of things you're talking about. Going out a lot, he can still do that. He's mobile to a degree, has a walker, but his short-term memory is not existent now, pretty much. And I want to know, how do you answer a question? He, he looks at you and says, okay, you work at the Oxfam bookshop. I'm good, can I come and help? And I think, hmm, what do I say to that? No way could he do it because he, physically he couldn't do it and mentally he couldn't do it. So I generally answer it fairly honestly. But what would you say? What would you say to, to a man who really physically couldn't do? He comes up with all kinds of things that he can't do. And I don't want to keep saying, well, you know, you can't do that. You've got dementia. Well, how do you answer that question? Well, it's a very personal question, um, um, but I think it's a really beautiful question because um, he has the need to, or the thought to, to go somewhere. Yeah, and does he, um, I have a few questions because it's difficult to answer s such personal questions, but uh, does he experience the fact that he's not able to go outside or uh, does he experience the fact that he has dementia or? Um, what I um, see in the nursing home I lived is that um, also my housemates, they had needs to go somewhere. And then the carers told my housemates, uh, no, you should stay here. Uh, you have dementia, we care for you. Um, but it had a very negative effect on my housemates because they were constantly... Um, uh, yeah, they were constantly being told to, to sit down. So in the end, they were made more sick because they were made dependent. They were made apathetic, what we call in a medical world. So um, I think it's a beautiful thing that someone has the need um, to do it. And, and we should do everything we can um, to support their needs. Yeah, yeah and, and having, having the will to go outside without being able to go outside, it's not always a bad thing. I don't know if maybe you wanted to say anything about, I think I read something in your book about the fact that when sometimes somebody with dementia will ask you questions or say something that you know isn't true or you know isn't the case and whether it can, I know it depends on what they're asking you, but whether it's, whether you should contradict people. That's a slightly different question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think Tian was right, your question's very specific and needs more discussion individually. Um, oh, that, no problem, you've got some water there. Um, also, I am, um, oh, three minutes, Ben, are we okay? Uh, no, we've got time. We can, have, we can overrun a little bit, go on. It's a really quick question. You talked about the vitamins, vitamin B. What's the difference between having the, the vitamins within food 
as to taking supplements? Do you think one outweighs the other? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. It, basically, it's, it's quite difficult to get the amount of, of vitamin from food. Now, the classic example here is vitamin D, which comes from sunshine. You won't get any of that from being outdoors, I'm afraid, uh, at the moment, even though it's a sunny day. Um, and it's important because most of the people in this room, unless they're taking supplements, will be deficient of vitamin D. If you're deficient of vitamin D, you have three times the risk of developing dementia. Um, so my take on that is everyone needs to be on a supplement of vitamin D. If you go to your doctors, you'll probably be given about 400 IUs of vitamin D, uh, which is enough to help your bones, but not much else. I personally take 4,000. The reason is I've seen a lot of people taking 2,000 IUs of vitamin D, and they've still got blood levels which are below normal. You need quite a lot, really, and it is protective against Alzheimer's, as it is protective against cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. So it, it's a no-brainer, really. Uh, perhaps that's a wrong word in this context. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> this is not a subject I know much about, but given the prevalence of, of this disease, I would imagine that a lot of people are writing enduring powers of attorney that say when I get to a particular stage, yeah, the quality, my quality of life is no longer sufficient for me to endure it. Um, but it sounds like it's a very difficult thing to specify. It's just a creeping thing and you presumably generally lose your sort of capability. But you know, is there any advice for people who want to sort of write and make provision for the future in, in their sort of care package? I wasn't totally sure what you were asking, because you mentioned enduring power of attorney, but then you talked about something else. You talked about end of life. Okay, um, I mean, if you, if, you, if you just want to sort of make provision to say, well, when, when my condition reaches this stage, sort of, I don't want any further treatment, or I want to end my life, or whatever it, whatever, whatever it is you want, and you want to get, write that down in a sort of, in a legal document. Yes. I mean, is, yes. is, do, do people commonly do that? And if yes, so, you can, you can write uh, an end of life wishes and keep it with your medical notes and people have to take, the doctors have to take account of that. But one thing I would caution people, and I think Sharon might agree with me here, what we feel now is maybe not what we will feel at the time. So we think, oh, if I get dementia, I don't want to live like that. I want to say now, I don't want to be resuscitated. But if you ask somebody with dementia, they probably would not say that. So it's rather difficult to decide now what you might feel like in the future. Well, it's a very um, typical question because it's, um, this is a very juridicalized world. So we constantly think about, um, we constantly think of linear processes. So if I reach this point, I don't want to live. But life is not like that. Um, but uh, I think it's a very important question because um, when we think about ethics around dementia, we mainly think about euthanasia around dementia. And I think that's a bad thing because ethics is about asking questions constantly. And there are many things in this system which result in more quantity of life, but not in quality of life. So if people are living at home, for instance, then uh, the home care is saying you should remove the, um, the carpets because you could fall. And all those kind of things lead in the end to um, uh, more quantity of life without um, a direct link in quality of life. And at the end, we are afraid in our society of death. Are people allowed to die because they just fell, broke a hip, and they, they died in two weeks? Um, what I see in the Netherlands is that we, again, try to solve all those risks with new products. Now, people in the Netherlands got a hip airbag. So when they could fall, uh, something blows up. <laughs> Wow. It's, yeah, we laugh about it. It's really serious in, in the nursing home, all those kind of products. And I think the most important 
questions because asking questions is the most important thing we could do. Why do we do the things we do them at this moment? And I think asking like those questions are, are very, very um, important. Yeah. Yeah. So we should do it more. Can I just nip in? Um, a member of the uh, virtual audience, uh, could I have the name of the doctor who is getting results um, for milder cases? Can you remember the name? Dale Bredesen. You can you use the microphone? Because the... Use your microphone. Oh, Dale Bredesen. Um, could I also say that if they go to uh, my website, there is a uh, leaflet on it on Alzheimer's and it does cover um, what Dale Bredesen is doing. Okay, so Dr. Jerry Thompson's website, is it, is it jerrythompson.com? If you put Dr. Jerry Thompson in Google, um, uh, or strictly it's, it's dr then Jerry thompson.co.uk but you'll get the website up and go to the leaflet section it's got one on alzheimer's it covers dale bredesen and what he does super super let's move to the next question yes um thank you very much for talking about prevention issues to do with diet and physical exercise one good exercise is doing a plank if you know what that is <laughs> um uh, you, you, it would be helpful if you talked more about brain exercises specifically um i understand you, you talked about early education and that's fine once people pass their 30s or so rarely um, continue their education it would be helpful if there are any tips you could give us um, um I, i've heard that uh, learning a new language or or being a juggler is, is very helpful for your brain. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. It's not a case of doing lots of crosswords and lots of Sudoku. That will just make you better at doing crosswords and Sudoku. It's good to learn new things. So learning a language is just learning something completely new. Uh, learning to play a musical instrument. As you said, learning to juggle. <laughs> Anything that actually is different and new to you and then makes your brain go in a different direction. Thank you. I, think I, could, uh, I just want to add one thing which you, you can try for free. There is something called Brain HQ, which a lot of research behind it, uh, Brain HQ, and you can do a free daily exercise and it's different every day. And that has been uh, shown to be helpful. Thank you. I think we've got time for one last question. One last question. Um, had an uncle who was losing it, but was able to uh, live at home. Um, it was a little bit of a firefighting exercise, supporting him. Um, so my question is, um, there are people who have some capacity, but it's limited. When you're dealing with a child, you take into account uh, their wishes but you don't necessarily do everything that a child wishes. Um, presumably, you can say the same about an adult uh, that's lost some mental capacity. So can you give any advice on uh, how to compromise, uh, take, take into account wishes, but uh, not always go along with them? We have in the UK something called the Mental Capacity Act and it's very, very specific and it says that we have to assume capacity. We have to assume that people do have the capacity to make a decision. Sometimes you might have to explain it more clearly to them or show them in a different way. Having said that, it's capacity is decision specific. So somebody might have the capacity to decide if they want to go outside into the garden, but they may not have the capacity to manage their money. So we, we actually have a Mental Capacity Act that um, takes all that into account. So you have to remember that capacity is decision specific. People are not, they, they don't not have capacity. They may have capacity to do some things and not other things, which is what you've just said. 
Um, he certainly was able to manage a routine, absolutely things that were absolutely routine. Okay. Uh, we need the microphone if you're going to do a um, sorry. It's, the it's virtual, just so the people online can hear you. The, the virtual audience won't hear you. So um, that's we sorry, we thought that was the last question. So they put it away, bless them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, just talk. Um, so Uncle Tom was able to um, feed himself keep his house tolerably clean. Uh, he actually wasn't able to take decisions. Uh, this isn't just my opinion. This was something that a social worker observed too. Um, so anything slightly out of the routine, like he needed a new pair of trousers, that was something that just wouldn't get clocked. Um, so it made life a bit difficult. Uh, for us, that's the sort of situation that um, that's an example of the sort of situation that I was thinking of. What's the question? So, uh, how to compromise between letting uh, some somebody take decisions uh, and uh, when observing that uh, a decision is totally unrealistic. For instance, do you want to answer or shall I also? Yeah, okay. I think I think it's um, um, I think it's important to search for a compromise. But what happens, uh, from my opinion, at this moment is that we have an image which is not nuanced about dementia. So we have a big fear about dementia. But not everyone with dementia is the same. Every one of us is a human being and has different capacities. Um, but at this moment, we don't give people the opportunity to take part or to, um, to make decisions because we have a fear. So it's about, especially in the care system, it's about a collective thinking. So now at this moment, in decision making, it's not about saying that safety is not important because it's always about the balance between safety and quality of life. But at this moment, we mainly focus on the collective safety that the individual quality of life is uh, under pressure. So um, in, in the case of your uncle, um, I think it's beautiful if, if he, he could stay at home and have his own routine and the fact that there is no compromise for him. We should ask the question, is it the problem for him? Or is the problem for us? And many times the, the things what we think is a problem is uh, because of our own thoughts. So what I've learned from my housemates is that they are a mirror to me. And I really had to learn to listen because we are not used to listening anymore in our society. And also I, in my education, I learned many methodologies, for instance, motivational speaking, and part of the methodology was listening. But since I was living together with them, I, it was the first time I really learned how to listen. And then the compromise comes from people themselves, not always verbally, but also by people's behavior. For instance, the last thing, my housemate Ida, she came every week in my room and then I was playing accordion and her um, will was to come in my room because every time she came, she opened the door herself. Her legal representative said, this is not allowed anymore because you, become too, you come too close. But her voice was very clear, I want to go inside. So it's about um, um, listening to people also if they don't have a verbal voice and also if people don't have, in our opinion, the capacity to decide. Because I think there are also people without dementia who don't have the capacity. <laughs> but because they don't have dementia, we think they have the capacity. Yeah. Yeah, poor, poor decision making isn't limited to people with dementia. <laughs> um, thank you. So I'm conscious that we've run over time. It's been so interesting. We've had some fantastic um, questions from everyone. It's a lot of food for thought. And um, 
I, I guess it's left me thinking that you know dementia isn't something that's going away it's not something we can fix but what we can do um, is recognize individual choices about you know the way that we live our lives now whatever age we are that might improve our quality of life but also thinking about how do we improve the quality of life um, for people that are living with dementia and it's really about yeah absolutely the, the individual we're all humans and, and it's rec recognizing that I think the best word I'm constantly looking at it when I hear the discussions is, is the word over there, it's hope. The hope for a better future, the hope for a more inclusive society for people with dementia. But we have to realize that um, uh, we are the change. And if we don't change our own perspective, the perspective of people with dementia, we could be someone with dementia ourselves, won't change even. So we have to keep the hope for the better future, and I strongly believe that the better future will be there. Thank you, too. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'd really like to thank Tune Tubis, Jerry Thompson, and Mary Jordan for their time today. It's been really interesting to listen to, and I know all three of you are very happy to sign any books afterwards. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, the panel aren't able to get into discussions about individual cases, but they'll be more than happy to, to book sign and chat, chat briefly later on. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, can I just say a big thank you to Alice Adams for chairing as well. So um, the shop is open, the shop is selling all three books and, uh, and across the foyer, the three will be signing as well. So, so see you tomorrow.